Hello, um, welcome to our webinar on to board or not to board um, and uh, what is best for your parrot when you travel. Uh, my name is Laura Doring. I am your host for today and uh, Dr. Stephanie Lamb will be our special guest. Um, we'll have her up in a minute and I wanted to ask uh, you guys some qu a question about traveling with your birds. So I'm going to launch a, um, a poll question for y'all. And here we go while we wait for people to log on. Um, so the question is, have you traveled with your bird? So, no, not yet. Yes, but never again. Yes, had a great time. And I'm sure there's many things in between those three, but those are the options you have for today. <laughs> so, wow, this is gonna be, now Dr. Lamb, you're gonna, you're gonna like this because you're gonna be giving people who are new to travel with their bird because so far, 75% of our respondents have said, no, not yet. So, ah. <laughs> so we will, you will give them some, some, some good tidbits yes. on how to start. Yeah. Yes. And then, um, yes, and had a great time at 25%. And a good sign is yes, but never again, so far has zero, zero votes. So, um, <laughs> let's see. Um, We'll give a little more time here, another minute. Um, I guess I should have asked, uh, I mean, on long trips or, or short trips, that's kind of a big difference there if you're doing a, uh, a day trip versus a, you know, a long haul trip, because that could definitely affect your experience. <laughs> Just like everyone else in the car, you know, the are we there yet? You wonder, <laughs> do birds have that are we there yet kind of attitude as well when you're on a, you know, like a you know, cross country drive with the flock. Yeah. <laughs> So let's see here. Um, all right, once again, the question is, have you traveled with your bird? And the options are no, not yet. Yes, never again, or yes, but never again. And yes, had a great time. Um, so far, not yet is uh, most of the respondents at 75%. 0% have traveled, but don't wanna do it again. And then, um, 25% so far have had a great time traveling with their bird. So that is, we're gonna find out more when we uh, start this webinar with the, uh, the, the questions and answers too at the end. Um, okay, so I am going to close the poll and I will share the results. Um, let's give it another five, four, three, two, one. If you're logging on, that was our poll question for today. And I am ending it. Okay. So um, let's share the results. There we go. So this will be interesting. We will have hopefully um, some people learning on how to safely travel with their bird to make everybody happy and comfortable along the way. And, all right. Thank you all for, for submitting your poll answers there. And now on to the webinar. So once again, uh, my name is Laura Doring, and our special guest today is Dr. Stephanie Lamb. And the topic is to board or not to board, what is best for your parrot when you travel? So Dr. Lamb, um, let's take it away. All right, good to be back with you guys again. Um, so, you know, it's, it's summertime, and with it being summertime, most people are having a little bit more of free time to get out and vacation. It's a classical time of year to be doing vacationing. This year may be a little bit different, I think, compared to uh, most years, of course, because the country and the world is still dealing with uh, COVID-19. But hopefully some people are still getting out um, and getting to travel safely, um, you know, maybe to see family um, that's close to them or, or maybe going to some secluded places where they're able to social distance appropriately. Um, but hopefully people are still getting out to, to get their mind off of things and get the much needed vacations everybody needs. Now, um, it's always a question though, when you have any kind of pet, um, what should you do with them when you are going on vacation? And I think birds are really a, a special um, species to be considering, you know, what we need to do with them when, when um, we go on vacation. Because 
you know, for classical pets of dogs and cats, there's lots of great options. M most people are um, knowledgeable about dogs and cats and can uh, go to boarding facilities very easily or have friends or family take care of pets. But parrots and birds are a little more um, uh, tricky sometimes. So there's there are several options that are available. And, and today I really wanted to go over those different options that are available and um, really help people to maybe figure out what's best for them. Because I think that just like anything else, um, there's no one perfect one size fits all for all families and um, different families and different situations are going to necessitate different care for for birds um, when people are vacationing. So I do have um, some photos here. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quick. Um, so it's telling me I can't. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Let's, uh, all right, let me bear with me here. I'm going to, um, gosh, uh, all right. Let's see. That's unfortunate, but we will, we will overcome this issue yes. here. Um, give me one second. Uh, okay. Ready? Here we go. This should work. Okay. Let me cross my fingers. Tell me you can see the share screen now. I can see the share screen. Yay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and open up uh, my slideshow here. And okay, so just a few a few photos um, to go over what uh, options we have. So the first option I wanted to to talk about. Um, is boarding facilities. So um, this is a picture of a boarding facility uh, that is in the area where I am. Um, and it's a bird specific boarding facility. So a boarding facility is somewhere where we are taking our birds um, that's outside of our home where they're going to be staying at a location um, and people are gonna be caring for them. So there's boarding facilities that are meant for all animals. There's boarding facilities that are meant for specific animals. And really it's best to probably go with a boarding facility in most situations. Um, that's a bird specific boarding facility if we're gonna go for a boarding facility. And the reason being is because, like I mentioned before, most people understand dogs, most people understand cats, but a bird is a different thing. Um, and it's really important if someone is gonna be watching your bird that they're a bird savvy individual, that they know how to care for birds, that they know what's appropriate for birds to eat and not eat, that they know how to interact with birds, they know what toys are appropriate for birds, they know what um, things they can have in the same room as a bird, um, you know, because birds are sensitive and we do worry about things like, you know, chemical agents around them or um, candles and, and uh, aerosols. And so, you know, at maybe some places that don't really focus much on birds for boarding, there could potentially uh, be some, some risks. Now, um, so, so, a lot of cases that I, if people are going to be boarding their bird somewhere, I would recommend that they do either a bird specific boarding facility or at least have somebody there who is very bird savvy, who knows what they are um, doing. This particular boarding facility, if you look at the, the cages here, um, you know, we've got nice large cages, they have appropriate perches, appropriate food dishes. You'll also notice that there is space between the cages. Um, I think that's really important because you don't want uh, one bird to be climbing on a cage and another bird to kind of try to reach through and potentially grab a toe or something like that. So it's important to make sure that there's space between individuals. The other thing that I think is really important with boarding facilities, especially those boarding facilities that are bird specific, is that those birds that are going into those facilities have had some sort of veterinary check before going into a boarding facility. We don't want to be mixing birds that are um, from different homes 
um, that could potentially, someone could potentially be carrying something uh, and spread it to other individuals. It's just like kids in a daycare. If you have one kid come into a daycare and has something and spreads it around, that could be a problem. And, and we're certainly, um, I think, much more aware of that now in the last few months with COVID-19 that it's important um, to have appropriate social distancing, right? Um, so with our birds, when we're putting them into, you know, multiple birds from different homes into a boarding facility, best that that boarding facility require either, you know, some veterinary check beforehand to make sure that the birds that are going into there are healthy and, and not having any things. Certain boarding facilities I know have, um, asked for like infectious disease testing to make sure birds aren't carrying certain illnesses. Um, so those are, those are things to consider when you're looking at boarding facilities. A boarding facility that, that doesn't ask for um, some sort of health check or infectious disease testing um, that really is pretty heavy on, on birds coming in, I, I would be a little bit more cautious because you never know if somebody's going to come in with something that could potentially spread. So, so if we're going to bird specific facilities, good to choose facilities that um, are bird savvy, that people know what they're doing, but then they also are aware of the fact that birds can carry things and should be checked in some fashion to make sure that they're healthy going in there and not going to be getting anybody else sick in, in the boarding situation. Um, some of the pros of having birds in a boarding facility is, um, well, you know, there's quite a bit of activity uh, going on. You can have birds talking to one another. Um, it's much more flock-like. I have another picture here. Um, this is the same boarding facility. They have some areas where the birds can come out, um, but when they're out, these birds absolutely 100% need to be supervised. You don't want birds out uh, being unsupervised uh, because there could always potentially be issues. So they're very mindful of who they have out um, at certain times to make sure that there aren't going to be any problems uh, between different individuals. You could cycle different individuals being out clean appropriately in between those individuals being out. Um, but it kind of creates this more flock-like environment. And some birds really thrive in these sort of situations. Some birds really love to go to these areas because they can, you know, call with one another and, and, and be much more bird-like. Now, that the flip side of that, I will say, is there are some individuals who are more shy birds, who are more a little more timid, um, who may not do well in a in a boarding facility with lots of other birds. Um, I would say, and, and every bird's an individual, but just as an example, I feel like sometimes African greys are a little bit more sensitive. Um, and as you'll notice in the pictures that I showed from previous slide to this one, you don't see any African greys in the photos. And it's not to say that uh, that they can't do well in a boarding facility. It's just, I think, as a generalization, a lot of African greys tend to do better more in like quiet environments where maybe other individuals aren't screaming and uh, really getting crazy and having a good time versus maybe like a cockatoo would be so happy to have all these other birds around and screaming and, and just really uh, like it's going on uh, a play date all the time. So, um, you know, it's going to be good for certain individuals, but there are some individuals where it might not be the best situation for that individual. The other thing I will say too, um, on the, the sort of cons side, is um, it might not be so good for those birds that do have um, allergies. So there are some situations where birds are, uh, have hypersensitivity issues and almost allergy-like situation to feather dander. And when you got a lot of birds around, there's gonna be a lot of feather dander. So for certain individuals who may have that sort of hypersensitivity, maybe best to not be in a boarding facility just because we don't want to um, aggravate anything with them. Um, this is just one example of a boarding, boarding facility. Um, my next slide, I have a little photo of this macaw that's on vacation. Um, that is actually the logo for a boarding facility in Minnesota called Avian Suites. Um, and they're a pretty interesting boarding facility in that they have individual rooms for individual families. Um, so I used to live in Minnesota and, and I used to 
board my bird there a couple of times. Um, and it was nice because they, um, they did require that there was some sort of veterinary examination within the year of, of being uh, boarded. Um, they only had one family coming in at a time. They like scheduled like their drop offs and pickups so that there wasn't any interaction between uh, different families of birds. So they were being very careful and infectious disease um, mindful. Um, and the birds, like my, my birds would board in just one room. So it was my family of birds. And then they had like, you know, multiple other rooms where other families of birds would, would board. So um, a really uh, unique facility, um, but I think a really, a really nice facility. And again, it was just a bird boarding facility. So uh, the people there are very bird savvy. Um, they know how to interact with birds. They know how to read bird behavior. So I think that's really helpful. Um, the other picture I have here of this macaw, this is um, uh, the hospital where I work. Uh, and this is, I don't have the full picture of where we have boarding, um, but this was a macaw who, who lived with us for quite a while um, in our boarding area. Um, and there are a lot of veterinary hospitals that do offer boarding for birds. Uh, the, the benefit of that is, you know, if it's your hospital um, that you go to, that you take your, your bird to, uh, the people there know your bird. Um, they know the health issues with your bird. Uh, if there's any medical problems, what better place to have them be than at a facility where they're able to deal with any medical issues should there be anything that's problematic while you're gone. So, um, there's, there's various options there when it comes to boarding and uh, it's variable as to, um, you know, what's going to be best for, for your bird and your situation, but that's the sort of boarding option for when we go on vacation. Dr. Lamb, before we move on from boarding, a question for you. Um, so if you, are, let's say you're doing, you know, an upcoming trip, what's your turnaround time that you should plan if you're going to board your bird um, as far as let's say you don't have that health exam in the last year um, to get the test, you know, infectious testing done and stuff. Is there a lead time, like a minimum lead time going into that? I would say a minimum of about a week because some, some infectious disease testing can take a week, sometimes up to two weeks. So if you can really plan it at least two weeks ahead, and I will say for boarding facilities, it's really good if you're going to be gone during a time of year when it's uh, a typical vacationing time of year, say like 4th of July, yeah. those sort of weekends are busy. So it's good if you know you're going to be going out of town for some sort of more typical holiday weekend, book ahead. Holidays like Christmas, um, Thanksgiving, uh, New Year's, uh, you know, th those, those sometimes boarding facilities can book out like a month or two in advance. So if you know you're going to be going on, on vacation like that, good to call ahead of time, good to get a reservation made so that you're not uh, calling maybe a couple of days beforehand and there's no space for your bird. So. Okay. And what about the vet visit um, before so that you have to have the certificate that your bird's, um, you know, healthy and doesn't have any contagious disease. Is that something that, that would be add on a couple, like a week or two as far as to get that done? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So, because then, you know, sometimes things, I have certainly had it happen before where people have come in um, to get their bird checked out um, to make sure they're okay to go for boarding and I found things and I'm going, hold on a second, maybe we can't board, you know, your bird shouldn't be boarded right now, we've got a problem, we need to be dealing with problem, you know, th thankfully it doesn't happen a lot, but, but that's the point, you know, is to make sure that their, your bird isn't potentially bringing something in, or your bird isn't going somewhere, uh, maybe potentially being a little stressed by you not being there, and then there's some something underlying that then comes out and is a problem, you know? So, all right. So the next thing I wanted to talk about uh, as far as an option was uh, in-home care. So basically, it's where your birds are staying at your house. Um, so, you know, they already know your house. It's very comfortable for them. Um, you know, they, uh, they know where they are. Their cage doesn't change. Their accessories don't change. Um, everything is the same other than the fact that you're not there. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you have in-home care, you really should be having somebody coming to your house. There's certainly times where people say, you know, can I leave my bird at home for the weekend without it being, you know, nobody coming in and I'm just gonna leave a lot of food. 
I usually do not recommend that. Um, if you have somebody come at least every 24 hours to check on your bird, that would be ideal. And if they can come, you know, a couple times a day, or even if you can have somebody come and stay in your home to uh, watch your birds, that would be that would be the best. Because if you could have somebody come and stay at your home, then your birds now have company too. So they're in their home, they're in their comfort zone, but now they've got people who are there to interact with and they're maybe not too bored. Because if somebody does only come once a day, that would be the con side of, of in-home care is they might get bored, you know? Maybe they're used to being out a lot. Maybe they're used to getting onto their little tree stands and, and interacting a lot. And now there's only somebody coming once a day and gosh, this is really, really boring. So, um, if you can get somebody to, to come, uh, you know, more than once a day, that would be nice. And of course, whoever you choose, you really want somebody who is bird savvy. Um, there are, nowadays, I feel like there's there's uh, lots of pet sitting, uh, people who, who just do pet sitting. Um, and you can do searches for your area online and find uh, people who are you know, bird savvy. Uh, you can have them come into your home beforehand. It's nice to always, if you're going to have somebody take care of your birds while you're away, uh, no matter who it is, even if it's, um, you know, a family member who's still at your ho house a lot, but not necessarily li living in your house, you always want to have somebody come in beforehand before you leave so that you can go over everything with them. Talk with them about this is the food to feed this is, you know, um, the way I have their cage set up. Here's their toys. Here's what they're used to. Um, so that they're just very, very, very familiar with where everything is and what they're supposed to be doing while you're gone. Um, and if you do find somebody through, you know, like an online search and you find a pet sitter and they're new to you, you know, you can have them come in and see them how they interact with your bird, um, almost have like a little interview time and, and see if you, if you feel good about that person um, as being a pet sitter for you. So, um, and then the next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, taking your bird with you. So, yeah. um, you know, it's uh, the, the nice thing about uh, getting to take your bird on vacation with you is you know your bird best. Um, nobody knows your bird better than you, hopefully. Um, and, you know, you're bonded with your bird. They're comfortable with you. So if you're going to take your bird with you, um, you need to make sure that you have the right kind of cage for them to be in, that they can safely travel with you in. Um, and are you going to be traveling by car? Are you going to be traveling by airlines? And where exactly are you going? Um, because if you're going out of state, you do have to consider the fact that you might need a health certificate wherever you go. Um, if you happen to cross a state border and there is an inspection area that where you are crossing and you get stopped and you have a bird, um, they may not care or they may care and they may want to see a health certificate that shows that your bird is been checked out by a vet. Um, and usually for health certificates, they need to be uh, written up by a vet within 10 days of interstate travel. So, um, it's something that you can go online and you can look at, um, uh, you can just go and do into a search engine and type in um, interstate travel with pet and it'll come up or you can go to this very specific site. It's called APHIS. Uh, it's a USDA website and you can look up traveling with a bird to different states and you can find out what that state requires. If a state requires a health certificate at all, or sometimes certain states do actually require uh, birds to be um, infectious disease tested uh, for certain infections um, before they enter that state. So that's something to keep in mind. If you're gonna be crossing state borders with your bird, you might need a health certificate. You might need specific infectious disease testing. You might not get stopped, but you might. And if you do, and you don't have that information with you, you might need to turn around, which nobody likes to have their vacation interrupted. <laughs> um, another, another um, just uh, real quick, um, some species aren't allowed in other states, like Quaker parrots. Yes. 
Uh, unfortunately, they're not they're not allowed where I live. I, I love those birds dearly. In <laughs> California, you can't have one. So like yeah, if you're traveling to California, are you allowed to, you know, can you cross the border with your Quaker? That's uh, Yeah, that's a very good point. There are certain species that aren't allowed in certain areas. So um so check ahead, right? <laughs> yeah. So, and then particularly, you know, if you're going to be traveling via airline, you absolutely need to be contacting that airline beforehand and find out what it is that specific airline is requiring. Uh, most airlines are going to require a health certificate. Um, and again, you know, you're traveling into a, another state. So what does that state need uh, when you get there? Um, and also with, with airlines, you know, you need very specific type of caging or carriers to be able to bring your bird on the plane and you absolutely want to be having your bird in the cabin with you they should really not be going into cargo it's just um you know unless you're finding an airline that has a temperature controlled situation uh, you, you typically most people are going to need to be uh, if they're bringing their bird on an airline having them in that cabin with them for safety. I really wouldn't recommend anything else. Um, but also right now, there are certainly uh, changing things with the current state of the world. So if you're gonna travel by airline with a bird, definitely reached out and I would do it ahead of time. Give yourself uh, at least like three weeks, four weeks in advance of traveling with your bird, if you're doing it by airline, to call and figure out what you need because was, there definitely have been times where people have shown up at the airport with inappropriate things or not the paperwork that they need and been turned away and I think that's probably worse than getting turned away at a, a state line in a car um, because nobody likes missing flights either so um, very important to do your research find out what it is specifically that you need for that airline or wherever you are going um, now, in, this is actually a picture um, in my car. Uh, this, I wasn't going on vacation, but I was moving um, between, between states. So um, you can see I have a few different species set up here. I have one of my African grays, uh, one of my, a couple of my zebra finches, and some of my little budgies. Um, and they all have their different sort of cage setups. But the thing I kind of wanted to point out is, um, you know, one, these are smaller cages for them. They're more their travel cages. These are definitely not the size cages that I would be keeping them in um, at my home, but they're small, they're easy to handle, but the birds can still get around comfortably, um, have a few different perches to be able to perch on, a couple toys to interact with, food and water. Um, with water, just a, a helpful tip, uh, have it be shallow because when you're driving around water can slosh around in there and you can have a pretty messy cage bottom uh, if you uh, have too much water in a food dish so or a water dish so just just a little bit at uh, the bottom of the the container and as you take stops because you should be taking breaks with your birds and checking and making sure everything's okay you know you can give them a little bit uh, higher levels of water and then um, go back to shorter levels of water when you start traveling again um, but, you know, I think one thing that's important to know is, is, is your bird a good traveler? Do they, do they travel well or, or not? Do they get stressed by travel? Um, and you may not know that until you actually start traveling with them. Um, it's with your poll, how you mentioned uh, the one thing of, uh, yes, I've traveled with my bird and would never do it again. At least nobody said that. <laughs> um, but, you know, some birds could potentially be stressed and, 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 may not like to travel and may feel more comfortable staying at home versus some other birds may absolutely love traveling and it's a fun time for just as much of a fun time as it is for you to get away from home it could be a fun time for them to get away from home as well um oh and then one other thing about this particular picture is seat belts uh, so I have seatbelts wrapped around all the different cages because we want to travel safely. You don't really want that cage to be loose um, because, you know, if you're having to stop abruptly, you don't want them getting jostled around um, or having any sort of, you know, accidents while you're, you're driving with them. Dr. Lamb, was, uh, yeah. sorry, do, do they get car sick? Can they get car oh, sick? Yeah, so, so that's, a good, that's a great question. Some birds do. Um, as far as like percentage of individuals that get sick, I, I'm not, I don't know an exact percent, um, but 
I think it's a low percent, it seems like. I don't have a lot of people as a veterinarian, I don't have a lot of people coming in here with their birds uh, having histories of getting car sick, but I do have a few patients who do. And, and what does that look like when they get car sick? Is it regurgitation or? Regurgitation, yeah. So, so that's a very good point to bring up is if you do have a bird that does get car sick and you're going on, you know, like a six hour car ride, interstate traveling, maybe, maybe that individual wouldn't be best to, to go on um, a long car ride. There are things that you can do to help um, with car sickness, but that's something that if you know your bird gets car sickness, reach out to your veterinarian, let them know, because there are certain um, uh, medications that you can give that can help reduce like motion sickness, car sickness stuff. So um, this is just another picture uh, from uh, someone who submitted this to Labors of a of them traveling with their bird. So they have this, you know, smaller size cage set up, appropriate for travel, easy for um, the owners to carry this. A few perches in here so that the bird has different perching options. Um, they have toys and things that they can interact with while they are driving. The toys are located in such a way that hopefully they shouldn't you know, if there is a lot of motion in the car, nothing should be banging around and hitting the bird. Um, and then they also have a nice little like bungee cord there that's strapping that bird in nicely and, and safely. So, um, this is me <laughs> traveling with my bird. Um, <laughs> so this was actually this past March. Um, you know, so I've got several birds and I've honestly used all these different things. I've used boarding facilities, I've done in-home care, and I've even taken my bird with me. And, and here we are, uh, this is in uh, New Mexico. Um, she, I take her with me every time that I can take her with me if I'm not going somewhere really too far away. And the reason being is because she has seizures. And so she has to be on medication three times a day. And I do have a very, very, very wonderful person that comes to my home and takes care of my birds. Um, and if I really need her to, I actually will, will have her take care of my, most of my birds in my house, but she'll take this bird, Maureen, um, with her to her house so that she can give her medication three times a day. Um, but if I can take her with me, I like to take her with me. She does travel really well. Then I can give her her medications, make sure I'm staying on top of it. And she's just, she has become a wonderful traveler. Uh, she seems to really like it. And I have um, four parrots and she's like the special one that gets to go on uh, trips. So it's kind of like our um, little, uh, uh, alone time, <laughs> you know, her, her special time. They all get their own special time in different ways, but that's her special time. Um, I have this one picture of this individual. This is the last picture I have. Uh, one thing that I want to say um, that I think is important for all of these things, um, but I'm going to tell you a story with this one in particular, uh, taking your bird with you, is if you're boarding, if, if somebody's coming to your house, if you're taking your bird with you, we always want to be prepared for things to not always go the way that they're supposed to. So if you do have a bird that's on medications, um, make sure that the individuals who's taking care of them are have enough medications for the time that you're gonna be gone for and additional. Don't just give you know, a boarding facility or um, someone taking your bird uh, enough medication just for the time that you're away if they're on long-term medications because what if you happen to have a delayed return and then they're left without medication. So make sure that um, you're prepared with enough medications and then some for, for your birds. If your birds are staying in your home, um, same situation, make sure you have enough stock for whoever is coming to take care of your bird, but also make sure you have appropriate phone numbers for who to call if there's an emergency situation. Now, if you're boarding your bird in a veterinary hospital, your hospital where you see your or your bird um, is seen by the veterinarian there, then well, the bird's there with the veterinarian uh, and have your wishes known if there's any issues. Um, but if they're boarding in a facility, if somebody's coming to take care of them, definitely have phone numbers available so that if there is anything that happens while you're gone, they can, whoever's taking care of your bird can get them to where they need to be, reach out to the appropriate people for help. 
um, so that birds can be well taken care of. If you're taking your bird with you somewhere, it's good to research where you're going and just have an idea of veterinary hospitals close in the area where you're going um, to make sure that if there were any problems, which hopefully you're not gonna have any problems, but if you were having problems, where you could go should there be an emergency situation. Now I put this bird up here because this is Harpo. Um, Harpo used to used to live with me. Um, he now lives with some of my friends who he really absolutely loves. Um, but I got Harpo. Uh, he was a, a bird that had been um, he had a problem with cloacal prolapsing, and he had been signed over to the hospital where I worked. And so I had taken him for foster care, and uh, I was actually moving across the country with him. And everything was going fine with his cloacal prolapse issues. We were dealing with it for a few months beforehand. Everything was stabilized. And then halfway through our trip across the country in our move, he had a cloacal prolapse. Um, and so we were in the car driving with him and he was straining and he prolapsed his tissue and you could tell he was very uncomfortable and we needed to get somewhere um, to, to get some help because although I was a veterinarian, I was moving across the country um, and I, I, needed, I needed to get to a veterinary hospital to be able to help him. And uh, when I, where we were traveling, I, I knew some places that we could go but I didn't realize it was the 4th of July um, because we were moving across the country. It just, it didn't cross my mind that it would happen to be the 4th of July when this happened. So not only were we moving across the country, but it was also a holiday. Um, and so the hospital where I thought, oh, I know where we could go, they were closed. Um, so I had to make some emergency calls to uh, some friends that I knew that had veterinary hospital. Um, and we had to totally reroute our um, situation uh, and our travel plans to be able to get somewhere um, to get him the care that he needed. So, you know, things that are unexpected happen and it's good to just at least have a little bit of a plan to if, you know, be prepared if something were to happen when you were on vacation, so. Wow. Yeah. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen because that's the last photo that I have. Um, okay. So I had, I had a couple, let's see, a couple of que uh, questions and a comment for you. So um, uh, going back to having someone care for your bird inside, you know, going to your home to care for your bird. Um, I have found it helpful in the past and, and maybe it's something people might want to keep an, uh, a lookout for when they're cage shopping is to have the, um, the outside accessible food doors. And because sometimes you, you know, you have a family member or someone that's going to watch your bird for you over the weekend or a night or two. And, um, they seem fine when you're there, but they might be a little bit more timid reaching into an actual cage to change out water and food. And so I have found that, you know, the, the doors that you, they don't have to actually reach into the cage to that way I know that they're going to be fed and watered every day. Yeah. No yeah. That's, intimidation. So yeah, that's a very good point because, um, you know, beaks can be intimidating to us. We love them and they're the most perfect thing in the world, but you know, to other individuals, they, <laughs> you know, they may not be as, um, nice to some other people and, and particularly in their own home too. You know, when a bird is in its own house, that's its territory. So it is maybe a little bit more likely to be naughty to somebody else than sometimes when it goes to other places where it's a little less like, okay, this isn't my home. I don't know, you know, where I am. I'm going to be a little more well-behaved. <laughs> yeah. And I was thinking also with um, maybe in particular with like, if you have a small like flighted bird, uh, them getting out in the house, you know, like, yeah. like a budgie flying around the, the room because, you know, what they, the person did not, the, the, you know, you know, you, you know, your birds more than anyone when they're going to climb out and stuff and how yeah. to get them back in, but not necessarily everyone will have that same routine right. down that you do. So right. uh, I have found that the outdoor um, accessible, you know, we don't have to reach into a cage or open the main door if it's a short period of time is kind of helpful sometimes. So Yeah. Um, and then I had a question about, so we had the wonderful picture of like, you know, of your birds with the plants. I was wondering if you put the plants in there to kind of make them feel like they're at home in the car. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, that was a nice touch. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I do think of it that way. You know, we were moving, so I just needed to bring the plant with me too. <laughs> but yes, I'm sure it made me feel a little more relaxed. <laughs> so my, uh, my question was with, you know, that set up in the moment the conure. Um, I mean, if you are driving, that, there's, 
there's also the, you know, the small carrier option that people, like if you're going to bring your, your bird to the vet, but that might not necessarily be the best option if you're going to be in the car for a while as, you know, right. the carrier, right? Yeah, so, yeah, because really that's, that's for, for short trips, but yeah. for longer trips, you want something that they're going to feel comfortable that they can perch in and, and have toys to play with. So a travel cage is something that you should probably invest in if you're planning on taking your bird with you instead of use because the carrier again the only time your bird could be out would be when inside the vehicle for a break or when you reach your destination yeah uh, which kind of seems like it could leave room for error if the door is open and <laughs> you know, I, I don't know but uh, just yeah. the small carrier it wouldn't be a great idea for a long for a for a long period of time right right yeah and then um i had a tidbit i don't know if now this worked for me and I don't know, uh, it, it might work for some, but my Conyer, um, I was a whore. I don't know if I have speed bumps in my area, but I swear to goodness, no matter how much water, little water I put in that water dish, it's like, it, it just flies out of the cage. The water just splashes. So I, uh, as a, as an enrichment toy with my Conyer who loved water and, you know, bathing and stuff, I, um, I would soak, I would get a bunch of um, paper towels and ball it up. And then I would soak it in water. And he would just slurp the water out of it. Like, oh, wow. <laughs> like a slushy, you know, he would just like bite into it and then he would drink the water from it. Okay. When I would go on short trips, um, you know, like if we're just, we're going to drive a couple hours away or, you know, like a four hour drive, I would have this in his water dish, I would have like this balled up and he would just go in there and squeeze it and get water out of it. And then I would just spray it. And oh, nice. <laughs> so anyways, I, that worked for me. I don't know if, if, if other birds are. Um, yeah, that might work. Yeah, or or you know those birds that are um, uh, used to the um, bottles, you know, yeah. or birds that are used to bottles. That I don't. I'm, none of my birds. I I don't have any of my birds on bottles. Um, not for any reason other than I just don't. Um, but that probably would work well in a travel situation because there's the, typically the little stopper that prevents too much leakage. So there you go. Yeah, as long as you uh, make sure that the stopper isn't stopped. I heard that can exactly. Be yeah. Oh man. Okay. Those are my two little comments. Uh, um, so let me see. I, we do have some questions for you. So okay. here we go. Um, let me see here. Uh, first question up. Okay. Um, so Daniela asks, what tests should be required prior to boarding? In particular, new and confusing information about the relationship between avian or uh, coronavirus and PDD testing. Uh, recently became available. Can the virus be spread through bird dander, feces, and or anything else? Also, my Pionis parrot tested negative for avian um, boronavirus um, as a baby in 2014. Can I assume that she's not a carrier? She's a single bird and was boarded once briefly several years ago. That is a that low is question. <laughs> um, boronavirus is still something that we're learning so much about. I mean, every, every year at conference, at veterinary conferences, is all new information about Bornavirus. And Bornavirus is a real difficult one because when you look at studies in birds, um, there's variable incidence of how much of the population of, of birds has uh, Bornavirus. Generally speaking, about 30 to 40% of pet parrots have Bornavirus. Only a small subset of those individuals have problems from Bornavirus. And we have yet to know what the trigger is that makes a bird go from being an asymptomatic carrier to flipping the switch and having a problem from the virus. Um, and so, so that is a very difficult and controversial um, topic because it may be it may be okay because we have such a huge amount of birds that have born a virus already for them to go into a boarding facility with other individuals because they could be fine. However, there's many different genotypes of born a virus. Um, and we don't know how all those different genotypes work uh, in all the different species out there. And what we do know is that there is variability from one species to the next. Where they've looked at a couple of different genotypes of Bornavirus in one species, it behaves a little differently in a different species. So, so it's it's difficult. Um, so, if your bird is going to go into a boarding facility, 
and not a lot of boarding facilities that I'm aware of recommend uh, testing for boronavirus because of the fact that, man, there'd be so many, there would 40% of the bird population would not be going into said boarding facility. And the other thing is too, is they may not be shedding the virus at the time of uh, collecting the sample. Um, so although your bird was tested, you said in 2014, uh, and was negative for boronavirus, doesn't necessarily mean the bird doesn't have boronavirus, it means the bird was not shedding the virus at that time. To be more certain that you don't have boronavirus can involve doing uh, repetitive testing. So you retest a few times and if you get multiple negatives, then you can have a lot more confidence saying that, okay, this bird is unlikely to have boronavirus. Um, and, and generally people recommend, uh, you know, retesting if you're negative and you're really trying to determine does this bird have boronavirus, uh, retesting 60 to 90 days later. Um, and, you know, sometimes up to three tests. There are antibody tests that can be done in other countries. We don't really have that available to us in the U.S. right now. Um, there's one type of antibody test that can be done that can be somewhat helpful, but the one specific for boronavirus testing against anti avian boronavirus antibodies um, isn't available in the U.S. as of right now. That test might be helpful to combine with the PCR testing that's done um, to get us a better idea of who actually truly has boronavirus and truly has problems from boronavirus. And then if we do have a bird who's truly having problems from boronavirus, then that individual probably shouldn't really be going into a boarding facility. Um, because do they have one of the genotypes that is a little bit more virulent and has the potential to be more uh, problematic for other individuals? Um, we do know that boronavirus can spread um, in feces. It can spread in feather dander, but it does have a very short life outside of the bird. Um, it loses its infectivity by like 80% uh, within about eight hours of being outside of the bird, um, not being exposed to any sort of antiseptics or anything like that. So if you're cleaning appropriately, it's going to be broken down a lot quicker than that. Um, so at the very beginning of that question of what testing should be done, um, preferably the testing that I really like is just certainly a veterinary exam, just seeing if there's anything abnormal that we can identify in our typical examination. But for infectious disease testing, chlamydia, I think is a really important one. And it's going to depend upon probably where you are in the country, what your risk factors are. Other ones to consider are polyoma and PBFD. Those are kind of the big ones to be considering, but it really also depends, like I said, where you are in the country, what problems do you have around where you are. So. Okay. Um, and then, uh, Tame, I'm sorry if the names, Tamia asks, uh, what happens, <laughs> this is a great question, what happens when a bird makes a best friend at a boarding facility and does not want to leave? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's sad. Horrible. Um, well, a or two maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, they're going to have to go home, I guess. Um, but uh, so, some of the boarding facilities do like daycare as well. And I've, I've known a few people, usually cockatoo owners, um, who will actually sometimes just put their bird in a boarding facility for like a weekend so that they have a vacation themselves. Um, and the bird has a vacation too. And I've known some cockatoos, honestly, who have loved that, where they go on their like little boarding vacation um, at the boarding facility, they get to scream and have fun with all their friends, and then they come home. And, and it's like a nice little, um, their own vacation for them. So, so, you know, I guess I wouldn't feel too bad about if they find a friend at the boarding facility and they have to leave because they could always go back and potentially have play dates. <laughs> or maybe you could get in contact with that owner, or, uh, owner of that bird and maybe you guys could have individual play dates. I don't know. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um, <laughs> and then uh, Susan asks, if you are traveling with your African gray for the first time, is it better to cover the cage or leave the cover off so they can see? Good question. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I guess the question that I would ask is, do you cover your bird's cage normally or not? I tend to not cover my bird's cages, and the reason I don't is I used to. And then what I found is one of my African greys, Gigi, she uh, will just make a hole um, in the, the cover. She'll pull the cover through the cage bar, she makes a hole, and then she looks out of that hole. So, and she did that so much, and I was going through so many different cage covers, then I realized, wait a second, 
she's telling me she doesn't want to be covered because she keeps making these little holes and keeps looking out these holes and wanting to know what's going on all the time. So then I stop covering her. So, so, and she seems very happy and she, I think, prefers that. Um, so I don't cover my birds. But if your bird is a bird that likes to be covered, then it might be good to partially cover the cage the first time so that they may feel a little more secure. Um, that last picture of the African gray that I showed Harpo, um, he likes to be covered. And so him, um, I know that uh, he, he he loves to have the cage that are just slightly covered. So it's gonna be it's gonna depend on the individual bird, but but first time around might be good to just make them feel more comfortable and relaxed. Okay. And speaking of making them comfortable and relaxed, uh, back to uh, in traveling with your bird. Um, I know that like we all know you don't leave a dog in a hot car. <laughs> yeah. So let's say you're stopping for, for gas or for food, you got your bird in the car. What's the safest way? to make sure they're not gonna overheat or um, or even when you're driving with air conditioning and heating concerns you know, in transit, like what are your recommendations to make sure that your bird's um, temperature is gonna be comfortable and, and safe? Yeah, so you know, making sure that you have appropriate AC or heating in your car before you're going anywhere um, and that you're able to be at a comfortable level. Uh, when you're stopping for food, you know, if you can maybe go through a drive-through so that you can get the food in through a window um, and then you can sit in the parking lot with your bird comfortably. If you um, are stopping for gas, you know, paying at the pump itself as opposed to having to go inside to pay for things. Um, you know, if you have to get out of your car because you have to go into some, some place, um, you know, hopefully maybe you're traveling with somebody else where somebody could stay in the car with the bird and keep the AC or heat running again, depending upon where, where you're going. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you, there have been times where I've had to travel with my bird doing something and I just take the carrier and I go into places. So, um, and I honestly, I personally have not run into any problems with doing that because I just tell people, hey, I'm sorry, I, I have my bird with me. Uh, I don't want to leave him in the car. It's hot. And most people are nice and say, oh, no problem. We get it, you know, and then I can do what I need to do real quick and, and get back to the car. So. Okay. Um, yeah, no, that's good advice because I was um, wondering even if like, um, like, it, would you recommend, like, let's say like where I'm at right now, it's a pretty warm day. Um, maybe stops with your bird enjoy like a little spray bath, like to. Yeah for the ride and they can preen their feathers as you're driving down the road and maybe keep them happy. And, um, That's a great idea. That's a great idea. Yeah. You know, if they like to be spritzed off as long as they don't, they're not the kind of bird who gets stressed by water bottles. Um, if it's more of a positive thing for them, then yeah, that'd be a great way to, to keep them a little cool. <laughs> <laughs> and then I had a question, um, you know, cause a lot of bird people have bird people friends, which is great cause you get that support and everything. Um, what if you're going to be going out of town and an option that you have is to have your bird stay with another um, bird owning friend? Um, is there a way that you can safely have them, you know, and it's kind of like, uh, are there any precautions where you want them in separate rooms or, you know, how would you handle that or recommend? Yeah, so I would say it's going to be sort of the same thing as a boarding facility, you know, in that um, if you have a friend, who has birds and they're very bird savvy and you want them to, to be with them, um, you know, it's important to probably talk with said friend and be like, hey, you know, how are your birds? Uh, have they been to the vet? Um, do you do any infectious disease testing with your birds and make sure nobody's carrying any problematic viruses or, or infectious agents and you know you yourself also being like okay uh you know i take my bird to the vet um yes i've tested them for certain infections they're negative for these things um if you don't uh have the ability to infectious disease test or your friend doesn't have the ability to infectious disease test then probably best to do separate rooms um so that you're just being as cautious as possible um you know, and, and washing your hands in between, uh, or having the friend wash hands in between uh, going to different rooms. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it's also going to depend upon the individual birds, because they may not want to see other birds. You know, they, your birds may be like, I'm really afraid of this other bird that they have, and I want to be in my own separate room. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's going to be, I guess, sort of similar, your thought process as, as to a boarding facility. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we had a question about, so if you could just revisit real quick the dangers of leaving your, your bird um, alone with, you know, food and water rather than 
having someone come to your house to care for them, like growing bacteria in the water, yeah, the water bottle getting plugged up. Um, with sure, them. sure, yeah, because you know, I will, I will first say that none none of these things is with, without their own risks. You know, there's pros and cons to to all these different options. But the cons of a bird being at your house alone with just a lot of food and a lot of water is you never know, as you said, uh, are they gonna like dunk their, their food in the water and get the water dirty? Are they gonna poop in their water and get it dirty? And then you have bacteria overgrow in there and then they drink that water and then they now have a crop full of some nasty bacteria that could be making them ill and causing them to throw up or get you know diarrhea um, and then they could get dehydrated and now they're not feeling well and now they're not eating well I mean there's just a whole slew of problems that could come about from that one little problem alone um, what if you know they their food dish is filled but what if they dump the food dish and if you have a grate on the bottom of the cage and all the food falls through the bottom of the grate and they can't reach that you know, uh, underneath there, uh, and then they don't have enough food. Or what if they're just a messy eater and they throw things all out of the cage, because some birds do throw things out of the cage and, and throw too much stuff out and, again, don't have really access to their food. Um, also, you know, what's going on in your home when you're not there? Are you leaving the AC on? And what if suddenly there's some problem with the air conditioning in your home and the air conditioning goes out and you live in a hot state? That's a problem we have to deal with here in Arizona, you know. Um, and uh, if a bird's left in a really hot home or in a cold state where it's really cold, you know, and if the uh, um, heat goes out, I mean, you're not home to know those things when they happen, you know? So if nobody's going to check on them um, and they're in the, alone for, you know, a longer period of time, then they could, they could, it could be a problem um, for them and definitely not the thing you want to come home to, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, it looks like we have um, one uh, final question here. Okay. Um, so Susan asks, um, this is not related to travel per se, but you mentioned that uh, African greys are a particular species that may not do as well in a boarding facility because they are shy and liked, uh, like it quieter. Um, I was thinking about getting an Amazon, which can be quite loud. We all know that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do something that will stress out my bird. He is definitely a quiet bird. Your thoughts? A quiet Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, every bird is an individual. Um, so, Maybe if you are interested in getting another bird, it might be good to first see how your bird, see how interested your current bird is in other birds. You know, you can always turn on YouTube videos um, of other birds talking, uh, see what they do. Like, are they interested? Are they engaged? Are they listening to other birds on videos? Um, and then, you know, if you're comfortable with it and, and safe, um, you know, taking them to wherever the bird is that you're interested in, whether it's a store or a, um, a rescue or um, a, a breeding facility. Um, again, always being cautious about infectious disease and things like that, making sure that infectious disease testing has been done. But, um, you know, allowing your bird to then maybe be in the same room with other individuals. How do they interact? Do they have interest? Do they like being around other birds? Do they talk back and forth? Um, do they not care? Do, are they scared? You know, and observing and seeing how your bird interacts uh, before you bring another bird home uh, is probably the best thing to do to just really make sure it's going to be the right thing for your family. Okay, thank you. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. We have, I, I'm going to, we're going to squeeze this one in. This is our Final, Square, question. final question. <laughs> uh, if you do have a question after this, uh, use the Q&A uh, feature because we can capture that question and email you an answer if we didn't get to it. But here we go. Um, uh, Tamia asks, are planes bad for parrots? Can it be too loud? And is the pressure too much? Oh, as long as you're traveling in the cabin area, um, the pressure shouldn't really be a problem. Um, and as far as it being too loud, I, I don't think so. I mean, you know, as long as uh, it's kind of, they try to make the cabin area comfortable for us, right? It's temperature controlled. It's um, not too loud in there. It should be too problematic. Um, yeah, you can feel a little changes with the pressure, but it's not really a big issue. So, so I think honestly that as long as they're in the cabin area, um, no, it's really not a big problem. I've only personally traveled with a bird by airline one time, um, and the bird did fabulous. Um, so did not seem to be stressed in any any way by noises, um, 
you know, or, or anything on the plane. Um, and I honestly have not had anybody that I've known of who's traveled with their birds have their, have a report of any sort of, um, problems associated with flight. Um, but I have also really only had people again, traveling in the, the bird should be traveling up in the cabin with a person to be oh. safe. So question for you, you travel with your bird, do they have you open the travel carrier to see the bird? So yeah. do you have to be prepared for your bird not to be fully flighted? Or <laughs> just imagine a bird yeah. flying to the airport, which would be pretty intense. <laughs> so. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, you know, again, for me, just the one time um, I did have, we did have to open it, um, but that bird was clipped. Um, I wasn't too concerned about that individual flying. Uh, the kind of cage that we had that individual in uh, was not a one that had like bars to where the, it was very easy to see through the cage. Um, so they did have to actually look into the carrier. So we did have so, to open it. So I, my best to, to, oh, to tell them like if your bird is flighted, like I don't want to open the carrier or we can go into a room because I'm just Yeah, imagining exactly. They have those back rooms for security things. So it'd be probably safe to just go ask to go into one of those. <laughs> All right. Wow. Well, I think, you know, we got through like all of our questions. Um, that awesome. was totally awesome. Thank you, um, Dr. Lamb. I'm sure I, I can't wait. We're going to have you on again, of course. Uh, you're, you know, one of our uh, mainstays here. We really appreciate each time you come on with us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you're welcome. And then I'm going to tell our audience next week, we have another webinar for you. Um, Dr. Uh, Jorg Meyer will be having a special, um, let's see, a special topic. It's going to be about Boswell's journey, um, an avian cancer survival story. So uh, mm -hmm. we're gonna tug at some heartstrings there, I think next week. Um, join us uh, next Friday. And in the meantime, everybody, uh, thank you for logging on today, join our webinar. Thank you, Dr. Lamb. And uh, in the meantime, everyone stay, stay healthy, stay safe. All the best to your flock. See you next time. Bye. Bye.